Welcome to Hear, Believe, and Receive. This is Pastor Danny. I hope your day is really going great. And if it's not, I hope that after you listen to this podcast today, it will change. Praise God. Now, today we're doing something different. We're going to have a roundtable type testimony and discussion. I have with me today Pastors Roger and Linda Pickering, Joyce Miller, Ralph Gardner. And of course, Cindy O'Leary, he, she's with us too. She does all of the sound and everything. <laughs> Praise God for Cindy. Amen. Amen. <laughs> now, we will be giving a testimony about something that God did in our lives, and only He could have done it. We will be discussing what God during each testimony. I'm going to go first in just a minute, and then we'll start around the round table. But first, I know you're looking forward to this. Brother Ralph Gardner is going to sing a song for us. So just sit back and enjoy it and just feel the presence of God. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus Just to take Him at His word Just to rest upon his promise Just to know the saved Lord Now I'm so glad I've learned to trust him Precious Jesus, Savior, friend And I know that you're with me and will be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I prove you or and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus. Oh, for grace to trust you more. Oh, for grace to trust you more. Praise God. Praise God. Well, I'm going to start off today on a testimony. And I'm telling you, God has done a lot of things in my life, and I'm thankful for everything He's done for me and provided for me. Yes. And my testimony of what God did that no one else could have done took place when I was about 12 years old, about the year 1960. And it's something that stuck with me all my life, and it made me realize that God does care he loves us, and He can and will do something if you call out to Him. Now, our family was fishing off a pier close to where the St. John's River flows into the Atlantic Ocean. Now, back in those days, there was no 911. If you had an emergency and, and no phones that carried, you know, you didn't have phones you carried around in your pocket to help you. But that afternoon, I learned there was someone you could call on night or day, whether there is a phone close by or not, one that can do what needs to be done, whether you are close to a hospital or not. 911 or no 911, he can do it. The pier was about eight foot above the water, and there were jetties, big granite rocks with a lot of oyster shells on them. One of my younger brothers had just lost a fish and had baited his hook. He was so excited. You know, about getting that hook back in the water and catching that fish, he turned around real quick and just stepped off the dock. He hit the rocks on his back and bounced over to his front side. My dad saw him and yelled out to him, Hold on. And I remember my brother's weak voice says, I'm holding on. Well, my dad threw his rod down real quick and it missed the dock and fell into the water. When he got to my brother, he picked him up off the rocks 
and started to run to the car. <laughs> now I'm going to get probably choked up here because this is where it got real intense. He yelled back to me and my other brothers to run to the car, which was about 30 feet away. I was slow moving at first. I wanted to fish some more until I saw red drops. Excuse me. On the ground. I looked at my dad and his shirt was turning red. I got into a rush then. And my dad had given my brother to my mother who had been sitting in the car. By the time I got there, she was holding him. I got in the back seat of the car and leaned up and looked at my mother. Her blouse was turning red. I saw blood squirting out of my brother. The oyster shells had really cut him up. My mother and dad were praying, calling on God for help. We had not heard much about the faith message back then, but they were praying rather loudly and calling out to God. I sat back in my seat and I remember saying, God, help. Help my brother. I quickly raised back up and I looked over the seat at my brother. There was no blood squirting out of him. It had stopped. We were a long way away from the hospital. We tried to stop a policeman one time on the way back, but I don't know. Uh, maybe we scared him. I don't know, but he 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 went another way, and my dad was driving quite fast, but he didn't bleed anymore. All the way to the hospital, it just stopped. When we got to the hospital emergency room, there was no bleeding; it had all dried up. They took care of him, and we spent a few days in the hospital. They told us that there were over 100 stitches in his face, upper body, and legs. I can remember only one scar. <laughs> that was the one on his face that I saw the blood squirting out of. If God had not heard our call to him to help and had not intervened, my brother would have bled to death. I know God did it. And there are other stories that I could tell you about the mighty God I serve. God is good and He loves us and He can do whatever needs to be done if you call out to Him. And you know, it's like I said, we weren't taught much about faith back then. But God heard our cry and He did what needed to be done. And I remember, like I say, I remember that. And that kind of changed my life from that young age to knowing that you could call on God and He would help you. And I want to tell you out there, whatever your situation, let God know what it is and let Him know what you want. Let Him know what you need. At that time, we didn't know what we needed, but He did. And He helped us, and I know He'll help you too. That's my story, and I know God did it. Amen. And please excuse me getting choked up. <laughs> Praise Amen. God. Brother Ralph, are you ready? Testimony. Oh, okay. testimony. Okay. <laughs> Praise God. Well, I consider it a privilege to be here among all these wonderful people. Uh, praise God. The Bible says if you hang around wise men, you'll get wiser. So I know <laughs> hanging around this guy and knowing what I know from brother, I have gained a little bit of wisdom. I'll tell him that, but I don't want him to get the big head. But I, I, I do learn from these guys. And these guys do influence my life. So I praise God for each and every one of them. And uh, well, let's just start off with something not basic. It's <clears throat> Let's go back to the beginning of my life. Uh, I was a drug user. And I had, uh, at that point, right before I came to the Lord, I had uh, given up drugs, started drinking, and what else did I do? <laughs> uh, well, we did other things, too. I got into Eastern religion, searching for the truth. You know, there's something in me. You know, sometimes you don't know that you're looking, but I was looking. 
And I didn't know what I was looking for. I was just looking for something more than what I had. So uh, I got into Eastern religion and uh, almost got sucked into it. But I got out, praise God, the hand of God got me out of it. And I went to a little Church of God Pentecostal church out there on McDuff Street. It used to be called McDuff Street Church of God. I don't know if it's still there anymore. Sam Page was the pastor. Well, that particular week, my best buddy, my best friend, Chuck, Chuck McCullough, uh, had, uh, you know, he was messed up too, but not on drugs. He was just messed up <laughs> <laughs> up here, but it wasn't. <laughs> Might have been from previous, I don't know. But anyway. <laughs> He was really into music, really, really heavy. So uh, he got connected with the pastor's son, Gary, Gary Braddock. Gary mm-hmm. played uh, uh, saxophone, uh, was becoming a professional musician over time. So he got connected with him, and so they played together and talked. And so he got the, found out that Gary was a preacher's son, and he uh, got the talk says, man, I need help. I don't know. I'm just kind of messed up. I don't know what I want. I don't know. You know. He said, you need to talk to my dad. And uh, anybody that's out there and that's heard the name of F.L. Braddock knows exactly who I'm talking about and knows what a, what a joy it was to sit under his ministry and, and to know him. Uh, so he went to Brother Braddock, and I don't remember the exact time if he got saved right there in his visit or if he came to church and went down to the altar and got saved. But it changed his life. And so uh, Chuck, being a good brother and a good friend, came after me. Well, I had not had pleasant experiences in church as a young boy. It was dead and dry, and it was just nothing to it. I won't call the denomination, but there was just <laughs> nothing to it, and I was bored stiff. And I, when he invited me to church, I said, oh, no. I, inside, I was probably saying, oh, no, not this again. But he was my friend, you know, and I went simply because he was my friend, because he asked me to go, and I uh, – now, you should have seen me, uh, <laughs> Brother Pickering. I was decked out, you know. I didn't have the real long hair, but I had this long sleeve, tight knit blue shirt on with red velour bell bottoms. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and I'm walking into an old Pentecostal Church of God, die heart Pentecostal. They didn't have to ask me if I was saved or not. They knew I wasn't saved. And I sat we sat kinda sat kinda in the back. You know, that's where Chuck we sat about two-thirds of the way back. And so I couldn't tell you a word that man preached. He just, you know, going back and forth on the platform, preaching, preaching, preaching. Couldn't tell you a word he said until he got to the point where he said, Amen. And that's when I said, Thank God. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we're sitting there with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, and I had enough respect for preachers. This is a strange thing. Because growing up uh, on TV, I would see Billy Graham. And I always thought, man, that's a great man. What a great man. I just had so much respect for Billy Graham. I guess that kind of, you know, went out to other preachers. You know, I figured, well, if Billy Graham's great, they all got to be great. Right? That's what I was thinking. And uh, so during the prayer, during the closing prayer, it wasn't actually a closing prayer. He was given an invitation for people to come up and accept Christ. I did not go up, but he came back. <laughs> And I'm sitting there, and I'm standing there next to Chuck and wait for it to close, you know. I said, okay, okay. All of a sudden, his hand comes on my shoulder. It's the pastor's hand. Might as well have been the Lord's hand. <laughs> but the pastor put his hand on my shoulder. He didn't ask me if I was saved, Roger. <laughs> he knew I wasn't saved. Anybody who dresses like that in a, in a Pentecostal church, he can't be saved. Oh, my Lord. So he put his hand on, you never heard this, have you? You never heard my testimony, Danny. He put his hand on my shoulder and he says, Son, would you like to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? I was too scared to say no. I'd never had anybody come back in the middle of a meeting and put their hand on me, especially the preacher. I mean, oh, I, I, and my thinking was, you can't say no to a preacher. <laughs> I just can't do it. I said, uh, Yes, sir. <laughs> kind of like that. And he said, he walked me on down. Oh, Lord. And if that wasn't enough, oh, here come the women folk. Lord, you would, I was the only one that, think that came down and accepted the Lord that night. But you would have think, thought they would have had the big revival. You would have thought thousands of people came up to accept the Lord. 
Oh, my Lord, this boy has come up to accept the Lord. And they got me down on my knees, and they circled the wagons. You know, they all had their hands on me, and I couldn't tell you what they were praying. I couldn't tell you what they were saying. But I, all I know is the Holy Spirit, it's amazing what He did. He gave me the prayer to pray because bless their darling hearts and you want to say stupid heads sometimes, they did not lead me in a prayer. They didn't tell me how to accept the Lord. They didn't They didn't say, brother, pray this and mean it from your heart and accept Jesus and uh -oh. give Him your life. They didn't do They just gathered around me. Oh, thank you, Jesus. You know, all this stuff. And it was okay, I guess. So I guess the floor just kind of stepped in and said, okay, I'm going to have to do something with this boy. But they're not going to do it. <laughs> but the Lord gave me the prayer, and I said, Jesus, if you are the Son of God, come into my life. Yeah. I don't know where I... I see, Brother Roger, I have never, that I remember, ever prayed a prayer in my life. Mm -hmm. I went to church with my mom when we were kids because we had to go. But while the church service was going on, I'd be there coloring you know, or writing something, doing yeah. something, you know, just while. This. So I never prayed a prayer in my life. Here I am living in the United States of America. Did not know how to be saved, even as a teenager. Even as a teenager, even as a young man that I was out of school now, and here we are, I was in the hippie movie. Didn't know how to pray, didn't know how to formulate a prayer. The Holy Spirit gave me that prayer. Jesus, if you are the Son of God. Show me and come into my life. Well, the wagons were still circled. Okay, they're still praying, still praying, still praying. So, you know, I'm down here and here, and I don't know anything that's changed in my life because I'm still down on my knees, you know, and waiting for the ladies to get through. So they all disbanded. And, uh, man, I tell you what, I had an encounter with God. I mean, you're talking about God showing up. Woo! I stood up and I just started standing there and I, I didn't know what to do. I just, I started looking at my hands. I started, wow, something's different. Something's different. I, I, I felt so clean inside for the first time in my life. I felt like there was like this cloud that was on me, in me, over me, you know, and the cloud just lifted. And I felt such a cleansing. And I just stood there and looked at myself. I said, wow, something's happened here. Something's happened. Praise God. I had an encounter with God. And He supernaturally changed my life. That was in 19, November, December of 72. Right before Christmas of 72, we were down there during that revival time. And uh, it just changed my life. And that's when I knew at that moment that God was real. And he was really real. And he manifested himself to me. I didn't see anything or hear voices. His presence just like enveloped me. You know, you've heard Brother Hagen talk about the cloud coming on him. and It just kind of enveloped. I was just enveloped in the, in the presence of God. Mm -hmm. And my life was drastically changed, Brother Danny. And that's been 72 to 24. What are we, about 52 years? <laughs> I'm 52 years on the Lord, and I want to tell everybody out there that's listening, or everybody that will listening, I have never regretted a day of it. Amen. I have never wanted Amen. to look back. This life is so wonderful in Jesus. If you really get to know Him now, if you're not all in, okay, you need to get all in and get totally surrendered to the Lord and uh, just commit 100% like you do your marriage, like you do your job. Like, you know, just be 100% totally for Jesus. And that's when Jesus becomes real in your life. And that's when you're going to say, oh, man, praise God. No matter what I go through, it's worth it all. I'm never going to look back. I don't want to look back. I don't want to go back to that old person that I was. Praise God. And not only have I got a great life, I've got a great family, a great wife. Praise God. Amen. He loves God. And praise God. And not only that, I got great brothers and sisters. I'm telling you what, I was writing down the other day. I hope I'm not going too long. If I am, well, just hang in there. <laughs> I got a piece of paper out the other day and I, I just wrote, I said, I'm going to write every benefit down for being a Christian. Mm -hmm. What is every, I mean, I had a 20, every line on that ledger was 25, went down to the very bottom, 25, got the 25th one in there. And I'm thinking, okay, what benefits do I have as being a sinner? 
I couldn't think of one. Couldn't think of one. What benefit is there is to serving the Lord, I mean, serving the devil or serving yourself, serving sin? I tried. There's nothing. I couldn't think of anything. Being miserable. Being miserable. Oh, yeah. Who wants that? But boy, when you get Jesus, you get peace, you get joy, Amen. you get a family, you get a yeah. new family, you're joined, you get a, oh my gosh, that list goes on and on and on. The love of God comes into your, oh my goodness. Well, it just goes on and on. I just want to, just want to share that and say, thank God, if you don't know Jesus, make him your Lord today. You don't know what you're missing. Regardless of what you've seen in other people, hypocrites, bad preachers, or whatever the case may be. Jesus will never let you down. Praise God. Amen. Pray He's the real deal. Praise God. I got out of the Air Force in 1971, and I went to the same church that Ralph did. And uh, I got to see a lot of those uh, young men come in and uh, saw what God did in their lives. And that out of that group of people, I think we figured out one time there's like 30-something people in, in, in ministry of some sort. Uh, uh, but God can make a change in your life if you just let Him and trust Him. Yeah. Praise God. Anybody else got anything to say about that one? Amen. Amen. Yeah, that's that's, that's an a amen. good thing. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Amen. Brother Roger. We're going to go ahead and let you get started. And uh, if you got more than than one, We'll do that on the next podcast. Okay. So go All ahead, right. brother. Just right. have your freedom. <laughs> well, thank you, Pastor Danny. Um, as I was preparing for this, I, I got to thinking that there perhaps were some people who would be listening to this who might be wondering what God wants of them in their lives. Amen. And uh, the, it's a question that comes to every person who's born again. What does God want out of my life? What does he want me to do? And so I thought I'd share uh, the call of God on my life, and perhaps that would be uh, something of help to those who are listening to these podcasts. But um, I was born into a Christian home. My father was a Methodist minister, and uh, he uh, uh, moved to Florida when I was about three years old, and we've been in Florida ever since and uh, traveled all over, moved from one place to another in, in uh, Florida, from the top of Florida to the south of Florida to the middle of Florida and uh, everywhere else. But uh, we'd stay about three or four years, five years in one particular uh, church, and then we'd move to another town. The Methodist Conference would control where a minister was to be settled and where he'd be ministering. But uh, so I grew up in, in that kind of home, that kind of setting. And uh, while I had good parents, loved my parents, um, I did not want to be in the ministry. <laughs> had no desire. I saw how my dad was treated by many, some within the church, some outside the church, some within the community. But I saw how he had been treated and... Uh, how financially we were treated, and I wanted nothing to do with ministry. I didn't see God as a beautiful provider that I know now that He is. There is nobody that can provide for your life like God can. Amen. Hallelujah. And so my life changed. But uh, uh, through the course of it, uh, in my growing years, I, uh, my teenage years anyway, I grew up in uh, McClenny. And uh, my father was the, was the pastor there of the Methodist Church right downtown uh, McClenny. And uh, as, I, as I finished school there, uh, the church had moved him to Jacksonville, Florida. And uh, I remained there my final year. I lived with a a family that uh, was a part of the church. I stayed there so I could graduate from uh, Baker County High School. And uh, then I came into Jacksonville where my father had been transferred as the minister. And uh, it wasn't long after that, just a few years, where uh, he was transferred down to Central Florida to a town called Eustis. Well, I uh, went ahead with some of my college work and uh, 
uh, obtained a job, got into the insurance business. Uh, actually, I started out in the mail room, but then I became an underwriter with one of the insurance companies and uh, started traveling down to Eustace to visit my family. Um, and I met this wonderful girl down there <laughs> who became my wife. And uh, amen, that amen. in itself is just a beautiful story. It's, uh, it's one in which I met her as I'd travel down on the weekends to visit with family and go to church. I met her in one of the Sunday school classes for young adults and um, saw her one day. My mother was an invalid. She had uh, a type of uh, uh, multiple sclerosis, and uh, uh, it was a terminal type, what they called Lou Gehrig disease. And uh, I saw this one day after church. I was standing outside, and I saw this young girl go over to my folks' car. Dad was putting mother into the car uh, to take her home, and I could see, and, and I had just the spirit of knowing came upon me where God showed me she was asking if she could be a help to dad or to my mother in any way around the house. And it developed that uh, she, she did come to the house and uh, she was a tremendous blessing to my father and mother during that time frame. Um, my mother died a couple of years after that. But in the meantime, this lovely little girl uh, God pointed her out to me when she was standing at the car, showed me exactly what she was doing. So I had the word of the word of knowledge come to me. First time I ever understood the word of knowledge. I didn't really understand it then, but first time it operated in my life that I remembered. And he also told me when I saw her, he says, she's going to be your wife. Well, uh, I told my sister she had been visiting with me. We lived uh, in Jacksonville, my sister and brother and I. And so on our way home, I told her uh, that uh, God had shown me she was going to be my wife if she's the person I think she is. Well, uh, it wasn't long after that. The uh, three dates later, I asked her to marry me. <laughs> now, I'd only go, I was in the reserve, military reserve, so I'd only get to go down a couple times a month. But uh, brother Pickett, it, Oh, she is. God was setting me up for ministry because she's the she's the real pastor. Uh, I just have the title, but she's the real pastor, and God knew that. So, <laughs> um, but I still didn't want to be in ministry anyway. Uh, I was uh, invited to uh, to become a uh, a member of an insurance agency from going from the company side to the agency side and uh, I wanted to get into the agency side so I I um, moved to Eustis and uh, went to work for an insurance agent there who was going to sell me the business when he retired in a couple of years uh, and so we were growing a good business uh, he decided that uh, he wanted to sell his business uh, to another agent in town who had an a going business, insurance business, instead of selling it to me. And so I had to deal with heartache real early <laughs> uh, concerning the business. But uh, uh, this other man had a young fellow who was about my age, a little bit older than me. And uh, between the two of us, we wound up buying the, both businesses together. And so I had a good partner in business, but developed a very good business relationship uh, with people in the community and uh, had a very successful business. And uh, we had, uh, we got to the point where we had two locations and we had uh, uh, several employees. We'd have a sales meeting uh, once a week. And this particular week, we met on Monday and uh, we were sitting around the table, kind of like uh, these ministers are today with me. Uh, and uh, we were we were discussing what we were going to be doing for the coming week. And uh, I was not too happy with the way the meeting was going at that particular time. And uh, it was just kind of mundane and nothing really developing. Um, and all of a sudden, I had an out-of-body experience. And I saw myself in the corner of the room 
at the ceiling level, looking back down over the table and over our employees. And uh, the word of the Lord just came to me. It says, don't worry about it. A year from now, you'll be at Rhema. Wow. And uh, Yay, <laughs> I didn't know what a Rhema was. <laughs> I, now, I did. I had heard of Rhema because my brother-in-law, who married my younger sister, uh, he was attending Rhema at that particular time. He had uh, been in the ministry, in the Methodist ministry, uh, and uh, he decided to go to Rhema. And uh, my sister, of course, worked uh, at one of the churches out there uh, in Tulsa when they moved to Oklahoma. And so I knew Rhema, but I didn't really know too much about what it was. And uh, I found out that it was, a, a, at that time, it was called Rhema Bible Training Center. And it was a training center for ministry. Well, I knew I didn't want to be a minister. <laughs> I didn't want anything to do with it. But, uh, you know. Uh, but you love the Lord. Yeah, I love the Lord. <laughs> Linda and I were active in our church. We attended the Methodist Church there in Eustis, and we were both active. She had taught uh, Sunday school when she was a young a teenager. She taught children. And uh, as we married, we worked with the youth. We worked with children. Uh, we worked with uh, older class, older uh, adults. Um, I shouldn't say older adults, young adults who were single adults mostly. And so we were very active uh, in, uh, in the church there. And I was involved in music. Uh, I could read music but uh, and had played trumpet when I grew up in school, but um, couldn't uh, play by ear or anything like that, but I could sing. And I was doing a lot of singing, at the, a lot of solo work at the church. And so I had this idea, well, God must be calling me into singing. <laughs> and uh, I know what I'll do. I'll go to Rama, and uh, it was it was a two year program. Just started a two year program. I thought, well, I'll go to Rama and come back, and I'll sing with evangelists you know, around Central Florida, and I'll just go in when they have meetings. I'll go in and sing with them. And so uh, Linda and I packed up. We had two boys at that particular time, and uh, we packed up and went to Rama. Well. You get to a school like Rama, it's a wonderful experience, but there's a Amen. lot of peer pressure. Amen. Everybody's asking, what's your calling? Amen. Well, what's your calling? <laughs> what does God Amen. want you to do? Well, I didn't know. <laughs> I was going to be a singer. <laughs> and uh, the pressure just kept building, because, and it was from fellow students. Well, along about December, you know, just four months into the school year, I was in the shower one night. And I said, God, what is my call? Everybody's asking what my call is. I, I'm figuring I'm going to be here one year and go home. What's my calling? I said, all I really want to do is uh, help people grow spiritually. I want to help people uh, have a better understanding of the Bible, of the Word of God. And uh, now God didn't say this, but it was like he said this. Well, dummy, that's what a pastor is. <laughs> and so... So it hit me real clear. Well, okay, so that's my calling. I'm going to be a pastor. <laughs> and uh, so we were there. We decided to say, stay a second year. And uh, we were very fortunate. Uh, we were very blessed. Uh, we, we sold our business. And uh, after we completed our calling uh, at Rama, we, uh, we had accepted an invitation to pastor a church called uh, Faith Christian Fellowship here in uh, Orange Park, Florida. And uh, so we moved here in 1983 and took over the, the, the church from a former pastor who had left. Uh, he had had some problems and left. And so by the time we got here to begin pastoring, the church had dropped from a good-sized church down to just just a few people. And uh, uh couldn't even initially couldn't even pay our salary, so we uh, we fortunately had the insurance background, so we got involved in insurance, and that put food on the table while we were growing the church. And uh, but anyway, that's how we got in the ministry. And so, if you hear God's voice calling you, you know, just give Him opportunity, give Him opportunity to show you what it is that He wants of your life. 
but it's a wonderful life. He's a wonderful God. Amen. Praise God. I tell you, brother, I knew that when God called me, it wasn't to sing. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of people say that same thing. You wasn't called to sing. Me Praise too. God. <laughs> but, you know, and, and it's just the opposite with me. I, I had a call on my life early. And I wanted to minister when I was in the Air Force going through basic training. You know, I had one guy come in and say, hey, man, you a preacher. So I won't be. <laughs> but um, God, it, he's got a way of, of getting you where he wants you. Yep. If you, if you just listen to him and, and there's a blessing there. So we're going to keep going with this thing. Yeah, we, we've got some more. So um, Sister Pickering, would you bless us with your testimony? Just a little fun note here after what my husband said. The first time he invited me for a date, I had been cleaning at his parents' home every Tuesday and helping with um, his mother. And um, so this particular um, day, I was at the parsonage and he said he would take me home. And so his little brother, Randy, that was about seven years old, who loved me and his sister, Rhonda, who was a four or five at that time, I spent a lot of time with them at the house. And so his brother was just, was going to go with us. And Roger said, no, you're not. He said, yes, I am. Roger said, no, you're not. And before you know it, his brother jumped in the back of Roger's little Volkswagen. And Roger took him and drug him out of the car and set him on the grass and closed the door real quick. Well, I had no idea that he was even interested in me. But I did from that moment on. <laughs> So we're almost at 57 years. Amen. Amen. Uh, Amen. Uh, it's good. It's good. Um, my testimony is when I was uh, 10 years old, I accepted um, Jesus as my Lord and Savior at a Methodist youth camp in Leesburg. I love camp. It had such a wonderful um, meaning to me growing up mm -hmm. in all through ministry. We always tried to see that our youth would go to camp because that's a, just such a special time when you get away from your parents and um, you just have that special time with the Lord. And so um, I accepted the Lord um, sitting on a, um, a log out by the lake, asking him into my heart. And I really felt he was calling me to be a missionary from that point. But um, nothing ever developed. And I'm so glad instead he called me to pastor because the missionary, their life is so different, mm -hmm. and I don't like to rough it so bad. <laughs> so much. <laughs> but I um, just want to share a couple of things that um, were the Lord and couldn't be anything else. Um, two years uh, before going into the ministry or ever even thinking about it, um, I, I wasn't, I was saved because, I, like I said, I received the Lord as a young person. But I had never been baptized in the Holy Spirit. I didn't even know what that was all about. And so one night, um, I woke up from sleeping, and I sensed, um, I've got to get emotional here. Praise God, sister. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I sensed someone in the room. And so I sat up in our bed and looked around, and... Um, there at the foot of our bed, Jesus was standing. Oh, Amen. Wow, praise God. I didn't see his face. I just saw this amazing bright light in his robe. And ever so gently and softly, he spoke to me and he said, I'm calling you and Roger into the ministry. Praise <laughs> God. Praise and, God. And then he was gone. <laughs> you know, I was overcome by all of it. Um, I just laid down and um, I pondered over it until I, I finally fell back to sleep, not really understanding what it was all about. And for some reason, I don't know why, but I didn't share it with Roger. <laughs> I didn't wake him up. I didn't share it with him until two years later when he started sharing with me that he felt a call into the ministry. And so it was then that I shared him. The Lord knows I'm a person that has to kind of think and meditate, not have stuff just sprung on me. Amen. I have to think, meditate, pray about it before I 
I'm sure of it. And so I had those two years <laughs> to think about it. You know, many people only have one visitation from God in their whole life and, and never have another one. You know, in a visitation, God wants to show, show you something or reveal to you something um, concerning your life. Um, that was a special time for me. And I'm looking forward to another one. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. In this, um, Roger has shared a little bit about our move to um, Oklahoma and going into the ministry. And in the summer of 1981, we were getting ready to move to Oklahoma so that Roger could go to Rama. And um, we were downsizing. We were getting rid of a lot of stuff. Um, we were thinking about either renting our home or selling it. And um, we hadn't lived there long. We had just moved to, to a lovely home on a lake. I'd always wanted to live there as a child. And um, so we were um, downsizing. Um, we decided we had to sell, if you can believe it or not, Danny, mm -hmm. my husband's little green sports car uh. <laughs> that he had gotten and only had a little over a year. We decided that wouldn't be very good a very good family car out at Rama, and so um, he sold that and we were actually given another family car that was just a couple years old and it was going to be our second car out there but I was kind of feeling a little down instead of excited about the great adventure that we were about to go on and the Lord gave me a scripture and uh, first time he had ever given me a scripture and I have it in my Bible and I'll then go back and read it. And I want to share it with you who are listening today. It's Mark chapter 10, verses 29 and 30. And Jesus is talking here, and he says, Verily I say unto you that there is no man that has left house or brothers or sisters or fathers or mothers or wife or children for my sake in the gospel, but he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time, the time that we're living in, houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, lands. And this part I like to leave out <laughs> with persecutions in the world to come <laughs> eternal life. <laughs> we have a few he, days. He did. He did all that for us, and he has. Uh, he provided a great job for me in Oklahoma. We prayed before we left Oklahoma. Um, uh, where were we? Eustace. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Before we left Houston for Central Florida, I remember us praying in bed one night. We wanted our children to go to a Christian school um, that was a part of Buddy Harrison Ministries, and um, we knew about that through through our through my sister in law, and we prayed that um, I would have a job there at the church so I could be close to the kids and bring them home and so forth. So we agreed. And prayed for a job and when I went um, right away I went and applied for a job and they first offered me a job as a bus driver for the school and I said I don't know how to drive a bus <laughs> and I don't hardly know where I am here in Oklahoma so it wouldn't be very good <laughs> so then if I remember right they said we are looking for a receptionist I said oh I'd love to do that and um, so they hired me right away. And it was a large church. Buddy Harrison Ministry at that time mm -hmm. was large. Mm -hmm. There were, I don't know, 800 to 1,000 people in the church. Well, why didn't they have that job? Yeah. Well, it's because God supernaturally oh, saved yes. it for me. Right. And um, it, it was awesome. And I only worked Praise at God. that position for about two weeks. And um, a new position came available. It was administrative um, secretary assistant to Buddy Harrison and Bob Lemon. Wow. And so uh, I told my husband, I said, I feel like God wants me to have that job. That that's my job. And he says, well, if it, if it is, he'll promote you. You don't have to go looking for it. Um, it'll all come about. So he kind of waits more and things like that. And I kind of like to charge on and things like that. But I was respectful to him. And so I just kept for another week or so doing my job as receptionist. And all these ladies would come in and ask where to go. And I would tell them, 
my job. <laughs> and it was so neat. After a week to 10 days, Brother Bob Lemon came down um, to see me. He said, I want you to come up to my office and talk to me for a minute. And I said, okay. I thought, my goodness, what have I done? And so I came, sat down in his office, and he says, um, I need uh, to hire an administrative secretary. And I've talked to a lot of ladies, but the Lord keeps um, bringing your name up. Wow. <laughs> and I said, I know, because he wants me to have the job. <laughs> and he said, well, why didn't you tell me? And quit going through this. And then I went through what my husband said. <laughs> and so anyway, God blessed with me with a great job. I learned so much practical um, parts of the ministry. Um, I met wonderful, I met many national ministers, um, Gary Savelle, Ed Dufresne, mm -hmm. uh, Brother Hagen helped with his um, a service, and just so many wonderful opportunities that God provided and opened the door. While he had the books and all of that, I had the practical. And so the whole time through our ministry, through the scripture that the Lord has shared with us, um, he has blessed us with nice homes to live in and to enjoy. Uh, have so many brothers and sisters in the Lord and children. I mean, pastoring, you get to, um, all the children love their pastors and they come up and hug them. Um, and all of that has Amen. taken place from pastoring three different churches. And that just continues as we are here at Go Church, serving the Lord and um, being faithful putting our hand to whatever we can. Do I have time to share one last thing? Go ahead. Go right okay. um, So we were in Oklahoma for two years, and um, my job, I had a lot to do with affiliate churches that Faith Christian Fellowship had all over um, the United States. And so um, anyone looking for a minister, those calls would come through my office. Um, and also, just a quick note, Brother um, Bob hired me in the new position on Friday, and he flew out of town for two weeks. Nobody <laughs> knew how to do the job that I was supposed to have. Mm -hmm. And I'm not exaggerating, but I sat down at my desk, and it was ordination renewal time and affiliate church renewal time. And I had files stacked all over my desk that I could hardly see over. And he was gone. Of course, I learned he didn't really know later what to do. <laughs> but I sat down and I started to get upset. What do I do? And the Lord said, take one file and open it, and I'll show you what to do. And so he led me through wow. that and took a long time, but I got through the files and so he supernaturally showed it. And we just listened He'll show and direct and number our steps. But this phone call came through, and I never wanted to use my office, um, my job there in the office in the wrong way. But but I got a call from this individual in Orange Park, look, and he said, we're looking for a pastor. We're at Faith Christian Fellowship. Our pastor has resigned, and we need a new one. And I said, okay, um, I'll, I'll tell Brother Bob he knew him. And that he took care of him. I said, I'll have him call you. And so Bob was in the office that day and I went in and, well, I first went home and told Roger about it. And so I guess it was the next day. I went in the office and um, told Bob that he needed to call this individual. And um, I said, I really feel that he, um, they, that it's right for Roger and I to go and, um, Try out, that was the term they used. Try out for that ministry. Okay, but I don't want to lose you. <laughs> uh, we had a good relationship, he and his wife, Mary Bell. So um, he arranged it, and they arranged for us to come down to Orange Park. We were from Central Florida. We really felt like we'd be in Oklahoma maybe another year or so. Roger had an opportunity to continue working with Buddy Harrison's ministry, but we felt that we should go. And so on the airplane, um, I was all excited. I tend to get more excited. He's more laid back. <laughs> and so I got excited. We were reading some kind of um, literature or something. 
and he was probably trying to study and I was talking 90 miles an hour. And I said, you know what? I feel like the Lord has a, has a word for me to give to, to a lady at church on um, Sunday when we're there. I said, the Lord told me that she was going to be wearing a black and white blouse and she had red hair and her son would be sitting next to her. Well, he just looked at me. Because <laughs> I had never moved in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I just sort of knew about them. And your first visit too, right? Your first yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> and my first visit to the church. So he says, well, if it's from the Lord, she'll be there. You know, just like you said with my job. Well, if it's the Lord. And so um, I, I didn't think a whole lot more about it. So Sunday morning came and they introduced us um, to the church. They brought us up front and lo and behold, two rows in front of me was this woman in a black and white striped blouse with red hair and her son sitting there. And I thought to myself, what on earth are you doing here? <laughs> you know, why'd you come today? <laughs> you know, I'm just being honest. I was scared. <laughs> and so I just smiled at her and then we sat down <laughs> and I didn't say anything. And um, the next thing I had another opportunity um, to come up um, when Roger was getting ready to minister, they wanted me to come up and say something. And I was hoping by that time she had left early, but she hadn't. She was still there. I still didn't say anything. You know, God gives you many chances, <laughs> many opportunities to be obedient to him. At least that's how he's worked in my life. And so finally, it was time for us to go and to close down the service. And I've been sitting back in my seat. And I said, Lord, if you just give me one more chance, I'll do it. And so it was the end of the service, and I looked at her. We were up there, and um, I said, the Lord has a word for you today. He, he shared it with me on the airplane. And i just like to tell you that the Lord said um, for you and your son to go back home to your husband, that everything was good, okay, and that he was going to restore your family. Wow. And she said, my son, I was going to take my son and leave and divorce my husband. I came to church to hear from the Lord today. Oh, and so God. it Thank was life Jesus. changing. Mm -hmm. And um, he restored their marriage. And um, it was an exciting time to see God move. And, About to uh, make me cry again. Yeah. <laughs> and coming from an outsider, that probably meant yeah. more to her. Yeah, yeah. it did. Afterwards, uh, that's right. We, did, yeah. we knew all the. Because I didn't know anything about her. Yeah, exactly. And so we just have to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Um, you know when it's really Him and when it's not. Amen. Praise awesome. God. That's awesome, awesome. testimony. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Praise God. Yeah. Those were good testimonies. And God can lead you if you just let Him. And, and like Sister Pickering said, uh, he'll give you more than one chance. <laughs> and he'll just, he wants to bless you. Sister Joyce, yes. I know you've got something good also. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you for the opportunity to share. And, and I had two, two things when you mentioned the other day and invited me to this meeting. Two things immediately popped up in my spirit. So, uh, so those two things is what I'm going to share. And, of course, I have numbers of things that I could share. In Amen. Church. Amen. But it really, really goes back when you start looking back over your life, seeing how the Holy Ghost has led you. Because when I prayed the sinner's prayer, I didn't, I, I'm, I didn't really know the words to pray. But I remember this particular line. It was a traumatic time in our family's life. I was 16 years old, coming home from the hospital with my dad. And I knew in my heart, I said, you know, there has to be more to life than what I've seen. Now, this is a 16-year-old. But I said, I want truth more than Amen. anything else. Amen. I said, I don't want to wake up when I'm 50 years old and not know what this life is about. And so... I cried out for the spirit of truth 
and I, I probably I don't remember exactly what I said, but anyway, God took it from there. That was just a heart strike. And that's one of the things that I've learned over the years. He hears our heart. That's right. Yes, he does. And um, if you be sincere yes. and, 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 and go to him as a father, yes. because he does love you, no matter Amen. what you've ever done. I was a 16-year-old girl. I was a, I was a good kid. I was the oldest of five. But I wanted truth. And it God seemed to, I, oftentimes I look back at, that my life was like one of those old ping pong machines that you, a pinball machine you pull it and you and this lever over here would you know slap you and you would mm -hmm. go higher and higher and higher it's like god put people in my path that uh increased me you know and so i was just so grateful for these people and each one it's just like he knew exactly what i needed when i needed it just like your daddy does mm -hmm. and so you know, I uh, I asked you know the Lord to come into my life. My um, younger brothers and sisters got saved too shortly after that. Uh, we all gave our life to the Lord, but that was the pivoting point. And then it was like life seemed to. I mean, God was increasing me, but there was something missing. And I said, you know, there was you know, I said, well. Maybe if I run with the best people and make a lot of money and have a name for myself, that will make me happy. And I, I did, I accomplished a lot of things prior to my twenty-fifth birthday. I was on, I was on billboards in major airports and Time Magazine, Washington Post, um, you know, uh, you know, everywhere. Um, working for a major airline, advertising, dating a professional basketball player. I was empty as dirt, mm -hmm. you know, as anybody could be. But again, God was still was honoring that heart's cry of that 16-year-old mm -hmm. that she wanted truth. And so I said, maybe marriage is it. And so I married my best friend, he, uh, you know. And so after that, it was horrible because I said on my honeymoon, it was horrible my thought. I really had my best friend and my God made. But on my honeymoon, I said, this is not it. And it was again that heart's cry. And when I got back, we got back home, had a lovely honeymoon in Jamaica and went back to our lake, my lake place. And uh, it was like, I'm still on that search in my spirit. And we went to the Methodist church in Danville. And I had a real, real good friend there who are a, a lot of people I became uh, good friends with. But her daughter was a flight attendant in Dallas. And I was a flight attendant that just took the airline. So I was actually, uh, she took a, a liking to me. She happened to be one of the most spiritual women in the whole church. Mm -hmm. She was one of those people that God put across mm -hmm. my path. Anyway, her, she was married to a doctor. She actually went, uh, was leaving, and the pastor asked her, Dottie, you can do anything you want. Because he gave her a Sunday night service. You can do anything you want. She said, are you sure? Dear? She said, yes. He said, yes. She invited all of these, it was, you know, uh, major uh, players in the, in, in the spiritual realm, uh, this, uh, Christian businessmen was big back then, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, that, before the night was over, uh, is I was filled with the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. with the evidence of speaking in tongues, with a Methodist minister's hand on my shoulder, his face wet with tears. Had no clue what was going on, <laughs> but it was absolutely precious because Amen. he loved God, Amen. and it showed. But from there, then the Holy Ghost kept leading me and directing me. And and uh, one time uh, after, I just remember that night. I never heard this before. I was so full. I was so happy. I was so full mm -hmm. of the life. I had desired for so long. 
and, yeah. and, and when I read the Amplified Bible, that when the Holy Spirit, Jesus said it was more profitable that he go than, than the Holy Ghost come. And I said, how could that be? And then he says, you know, he'll be a counselor to you. I said, Lord, I need a counselor. Amen. I need, a, and, and he said, you need a helper. I said, oh, do I need a helper? <laughs> and, and, do you know, do you need a good lawyer and advocate? Of course, everybody does, you know. And it was like, you know, I felt like I had it again. And so, I mean, I spent hours of fellowship and hungry after pursuing <coughs> truth. And when I read in the Amplified Bible, when the uh, Jesus said, when the spirit of truth comes, I, I, I knew immediately because that was that kid part of the truth. He says, he will guide you into all the truth and the full truth. And he will not speak his own message on his own authority, but whatever he hears from the Father, he will give that message that has been given to him that he will announce, declare to you the things that are to come. I said, things that are to happen in the future? Who what, doesn't want to know that? And so it was like I was all in, 100%. You could count on me. I was after him. And it says he'll take, he will announce, declare uh, the things that are to come, the things that would happen in the future. And he goes on to say it three times. He'll declare, de disclose things that will happen in the future. And so I would pray in the Holy Ghost. And then one day, uh, I remember just laying across my bed afterwards and saying, what were we praying about? You know, because this um, all right to the Corinthians, he said, he that prays in an unknown tongue, prays the perfect will of God. And in Romans, he says, we don't know how to fashion and form a prayer, but he does. And I says, I'm sticking with you because I know <laughs> I don't know. Amen. And I need, yes. I want results because I'm tired of the devil eating my breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Amen. And so I was after success with the Holy Ghost. And it was like, he, he, sometimes I think he treats me like, Somebody would treat a bloodhound. He'll put little crumbs out there, you know, and it's like I'll go after him <laughs> because I can smell him. I can, you know, and he 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 baits me is really what he does. <laughs> he baits me because he knows I'll follow. <laughs> and so uh, this one day I was laying across the bed after we I prayed for hours in the Holy Ghost. You know, you go through the routine of praying for your nation and those in authority because he said pray for those in authority. And then your family, et cetera, et cetera. And then we just, it was like we were on a surfboard. And I remember Suzette Heading, uh, she was one of my mentors in prayer. And when she first came to um, America, she taught us that prayer with the Holy Ghost is like surfing, that you get on that surfboard and you just start praying in the natural, you just sort of go out. Until you get up, get Just away, away. The Holy Ghost <laughs> will Amen. take hold together with Amen. you, mm -hmm. and you've got you just ride that way to shore. And so I rode that way to shore that day, and, and I was just sort of spent. And I laid across the bed and I said, "Lord, what were we praying? About? Who were we praying for? What what was going on there?" And I heard just as clear as a bell the word Arbo. I said, well, "Who's Arbo?" And so, nothing. Anyway, so what happened is that I, I went downstairs. I looked at a dictionary, Arbo, I didn't have a smartphone at that time. But anyway, um, you know, I looked in the concordance to find out. I said, there's Arbor, and there's all kind of other things there, but there's no Arbo. So anyway, so this was a long time ago, oh, quite a ways back. But, uh, I went on a mission trip about six months later. And what had happened is I had written Arbo on an index card. And each day when I put my makeup on, I'd pray, lay my hands on Arbo mm -hmm. and pray for Arbo. I'd pray in my understanding and I'd pray in the spirit. 
Anyway, I went to the Philippines with a friend of mine doing uh, a mission trip, prayer conference. Called in the prayer conference, had a great time. I said, since we're halfway around the world, I want to go to Paul Young and Cho's church. 500,000 members wow. at that time. Wow. So since we're halfway there, we might as well. It was really a little bit <laughs> bigger, long, longer than what I expected. But anyway, we, we go. And, um, and we, you know, the church was not in session, but they showed us around, and it was great to see this church that was changing the world with pastor, was changing mm -hmm. the world with prayer. And so I, um, we got on the bus. They said there was a bus that goes to Prayer Mountain, because that was my number one target of, of going, was to go to Prayer Mountain. So I went to, uh, got, we got on the bus, didn't realize there was a there's a big, huge city bus with not not city bus, it was church bus, nice bus. It left every 30 minutes around the clock. That's how many people were going to prayer now. I got up there and I thought maybe it would be a good crowd, you know, maybe 100, 200 people. Like that. We're close to 5,000. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so here we are, just everybody, you know, most of us Korean, worshiping God and, and listening to all of this. And, and then all of a sudden, you know, a while we go out and just sort of sightsee. They had like bunkers where people, they wouldn't counsel their, the pastorate. Uh, they would say, you go fast and pray at Prayer Mountain for two weeks. And if you don't get your answer from God, then we'll talk. So this is the atmosphere. And these little bunkers with a little concrete slab in front of them and a door with a little bit of screen at the top and the little uh, sandals on the outside you know there could be one person in there or five or six mm -hmm. but it was like whoa, whoa two bunkers in the side of a, a mountain all around and so we were walking around you know looking and listening to all the things that were going on and so what happened is that I saw one he was sitting there Indian style with the, you know the door open and he was praying in the spirit and I could hear him, salt and pepper, words in English. And those words were adoration. He was adoration. Absolutely awesome. And then it started raining, so we ducked into the no nearest door. And, you know, it happened to be the bookstore. And they were all these books and tapes and stuff like that all over the place. So anyway, uh, a few minutes later, here comes Asian couple that was from the states. I went and greeted them because I had, you know, seen anybody, uh, you know, from America in about, you know, two weeks. So I ran and embraced them, introduced myself. My friend introduced herself, and we chatted and and we sat down and started talking. And she says, "Honey, why don't you go?" Uh, and they were guests of of the Chose, his mother-in-law. And they were staying there on the premises. And so um, she said, why don't you go upstairs and uh, get some of our books and things? So he goes. He does. And he brings them and puts them down in front of us. And I look at their picture. And then I look at the, he turned them over to the backside. There was their picture and their name <laughs> on the bottom. You know what the name of them was? <laughs> the Arbus. <laughs> they were pastors in Massachusetts wow. Wow. at that particular time. And I said, I've been praying for you for six months. And she fell into my arms and we were weeping. Because, I mean, God was so on yeah. it. And my friend, who has a Pentecostal background, who has a heritage, grandmother after grandmother, grand up and ministers in all of her family, Pentecostal, she's pacing the floor and saying, y'all are freaking me out. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and so anyway, are we good with time? Okay, okay keep going. You, yeah. Okay, all right. Um, so that was uh, an awesome thing. Mm -hmm. Only God can do that. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Because... Again, praying in the spirit is praying out mystery. And again, this, you know, the bloodhound that I am and the Holy Ghost leading the way is, is that I'm after those mysteries. And 
Paul talks about the mystery of the church, the mystery of Israel, um, and, and, and there, the mysteries of iniquity. There's a lot of things. And so uh, as he was, as he's drawing me, I'm going to tell you a story that happened last week. I was praying uh, uh, with, a, uh, with a group of prayers. It's a nationwide prayer call. Uh, it's been going on for years. And I'm not the leader. I am one of the leaders, co-leaders. And so we were praying, uh, you know, which we pray for the nation. But afterwards, at some days, we spend 15 minutes just praying in the spirit for Israel. And so we were praying. And I usually you have to put hit bus buttons to unmute yourself because there's a lot of distraction sometimes. So I I had had my phone on uh, uh, mute, and I you know so anyway it, it didn't seem like but there's a lot of people on the prayer call but anyway I couldn't hear myself except myself and the, and the leader and so as we were praying. It was like the Holy Ghost cutting the air again. It was like we were on, we were working, as, as Paul said to the Corinthians, we were co laborers with him in his work. And it wasn't, um, praying in the Holy Ghost is not work to me. It's fun. If, you know, it, 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 it's, it's the labor of getting out there in his will. But once you get there, it is an adventure. And so, this day, it was like, it was so great because all, in my prayer, I was praying in the spirit, but I heard the word Yanni. And I said, I don't know anybody in the natural named Yanni except Benjamin Natural named Duke had an older brother named Yanni. And all of a sudden, we're praying for Israel. We were praying for the hostages. And, and, and the Holy Ghost, I hear, him say Yanni. And so as I saw Yanni, I knew that Yanni's not on this earth anymore. But I felt his brother's love and his passion and uh, for his brother. Uh, that, uh, you know, in other words, a longing and a missing and a, an honoring. I could feel his heart, Benjamin McEnany's heart for his brother. And then all of a sudden, I thought of Entebbe. That's where the Mossad and the idea, they actually, what there was a um, uh, Palestinian terrorist who kidnapped or, uh, or hijacked an Air France flight out of Tel Aviv to Paris. And they, it was 240, I looked all this up, 246 passengers on there. But what they were after was the Jews. And so in my prayer time, I am thinking, and Tebby, Edi Amin is, you know, I'm thinking of all these things. And I was saying, Lord, you released you, those, those, you caused them to be released. It wasn't the work in the palace of the IDF or the Mossad. It was you. You gave them strategy. Now give Benjamin Netanyahu strategy to and the IDF and the Mossad, all those involved regarding those 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 uh, hostages, to give them strategies, even as you did in Entebbe. And it was so strong on me uh, that the host, after we prayed, the host called me, and the leader of this who's perseverance and tenacity is absolutely awesome as far as I'm concerned. Uh, but she, she said, it was so good today to have you on the phone. I said, I didn't have anything to do with it. It was strictly God. And so what happened is that I got off that phone and I looked up that uh, raid on Antepi. I looked up Wikipedia. I read all the details on it. I kept the spirit of God was still on me and I was still praying. And then I, I looked, I found the movie, The Raid on Antebi. And at 10.30 in the morning, Thursday, the June 6th, I was watching that movie on the raid of Antebi and watching Yanni Netanyahu. 
execute <coughs> God's will to redeem those hostages. I later found out on Friday, no, Saturday morning, I got a call from a friend of mine who is Jewish and born again, spirit filled Jew. Anyway, telling me, have you seen the news? I have not. It was early morning, and I'm an early guy. But what happened is, he said Benjamin Netanyahu gave them the go ahead for this operation at seven o'clock that evening. I said, my what? That's that's my got on my international clock, and I said it was twelve noon. The Holy Ghost was still on me, praying out God's plan. Wow. But He gave the go ahead to execute that hostage, to redeem those hostages, and so they executed it in the middle of the day, and on Friday. Now. I, you know, that the Holy Ghost was still on me. It wasn't as strong as it was in the morning on Friday. I mean, Thursday. But it, it was all coming down. And they took those hostages, went in there about 2.30 on Friday afternoon, and got them out. <laughs> and all the things says, well, on Shabbat, they released the hostages. I said, well, I, I, you know, because I was checking me. And I was checking on the Holy Ghost to see if, you know, if he was on target or if I was missing it or something. But it was wrong. Mm. And I, I just, I just thank God for that. Mm. For the honor and the privilege to serve sure. with the creator of the heavens Ooh, and the on. earth. Amen. And the, who is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Yeah. And he's making the things of this world good. Yeah. Yeah. And he, he is, he has plans and purposes. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 That's right. Amen. And his purposes. That's what those mysteries are, is his plan. So uh, my invitation is to all, is to pray much in the spirit and then pray in your understanding. Pray that you interpret. Listen to the Holy Ghost because He'll give you cues, yes. is what I call them. Cues, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and you just follow them. And whatever He emphasized, you emphasize. Mm -hmm. Don't be your a long ranger, yes. just work with Him because He's the coach, He's the guide, He's the lawyer, He's the He's the helper, yes. He's the one that we want to meet. Amen. 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 Yes. Amen. Amen. Yes. Amen. We're going to wrap this up now, but I enjoyed these testimonies and I, and I know you did too. See, God, it, it's not just one person that God deals with and God does things with and for. It's anyone that is willing to follow God. And I thank God for these people. Uh, Brother and Sister Pickering and Joyce Miller and Ralph Gardner and Cindy. Thank you for being here. We love you guys. And if you don't have a church, oh, man, this is a good one here. So come on out and be with us. Go Church on Chafee Road. Pastor Simone, uh, she's one of the best. She loves God. She follows God. So uh, come out and be with us. If you don't know the Lord, give your life to the Lord. Say this with me. Father, we thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he died for me. Thank you that his blood was shed for me to wash away my sin. And Father, I receive that. And in the name of Jesus, I believe that I am born again. And I know that you raised Jesus from the dead like you said. And I thank you for that. Because if you hadn't, none of this would be true. But you raised him from the dead and I believe that. And I thank you that I'm born into your family. Praise God. If you've said yeah. that and you believe it in your heart and you meant it, you're a new person. Behold, all things old, old things are gone and everything's new. Yeah. So come out and be with us. We love you. And if you come to the church, just come and find us and let us know you're there. God bless you.